you know, it's hard to believe if World War III would have ever started, it would have started right here. Nestled deep in the Shawamigan Nicolay National Forest in northwest Wisconsin is the small town of Clam Lake. Clam Lake is best known for the excellent hunting and fishing in the area, and of course, the herd of elk that roam the countryside. But the elk population is more of a side effect of what I'm going to talk about. At one time, this area was home to a military base, and in fact, World War III could have been signaled from its location. I'm talking about Project ELF, the Navy's program to send messages to submarines deep underwater. Let's explore Project ELF, a Cold War relic, and still has an impact today. Early in the Navy's nuclear submarine program, there was a clear need to communicate to the subs underway. Submarines would have to either rise to periscope depth to deploy an antenna above the water or tow along a wire at a shallow depth. High frequency radio signals could only penetrate a few feet, leaving the subs vulnerable. The conventional knowledge is that lower frequency radio waves have a greater degree of ground penetration than higher frequency waves. But how low can you go? Research in the 1950s revealed that extremely low frequency in the area of 40 to 80 hertz would give adequate penetration through the ground and deep underwater. But early experiments in communicating with submarines were based on a variety of very low frequency and acoustic methods, and not so much with the much lower extremely low frequencies. VLF stations were easier to deploy, but the concern the Navy had was that VLF stations' proximity could re reveal the appropriate proximate location of the submarines through direction finding techniques. Other downsides of VLF signals was the limited water penetration and subs had to slow down and limit fast maneuvers while the long VLF antennas were deployed. In the early 1960s, a Greek physicist, uh, Nicholas Christophilos, made a discovery that with above-ground nuclear explosions, the high energy particles would be trapped in the ionosphere, causing a magnetic and radio frequency disruptions. But ELF, or extremely low frequency signals, were particularly immune to this effect as they don't require the ionosphere for propagation and have a deep earth penetrating properties. This imperviousness to nuclear electromagnetic pulses led to a greater study of ELF signals for submarine communications. Early experiments in ELF communications were promising, and this led the Navy on to continue experiments under the name Project Sanguine. The key to effective extremely low frequency propagation lies on in the ground. The bedrock, that is, a transmitter site and antenna array would need a location with deep rock and very low ground conductivity. The antenna system would be wires strung along telephone poles with ground points at each end of their length. The signal carried by the wires would resonate into the ground between the two points. This signal, immune to the effect of nuclear de detonation, could be received by subs deep underwater and then launch a counterstrike. Project Sanguine was a practical test of this system. In 1968, a transmitter was constructed near Clam Lake, Wisconsin, and a 28-mile antenna system in a crossed configuration radiated out into the Shawamigan Nicolay National Forest. This site, called the Wisconsin Test Facility, was on a large mass of Precambrian granites and bedrock of the Laurentian Plateau. The bedrock located in northern Wisconsin was well suited for this project and the remote area of the National Forest was far from populations that could be affected by the transmission. The Wisconsin test facility consisted of a single set of transmitters and 28 miles of antenna in a cross configuration, but the Navy had grander plans for up to 6,000 miles of buried antenna and hundreds of hardened underground transmitters pumping out signals 24 hours a day. The project wasn't without opposition, and in 1973, Melvin Laird, the Secretary of Defense at the time, and a former Wisconsin congressman, killed the project. This was mostly due to its now projected cost of billions of dollars for the expansive antenna network, but also growing environmental and public concerns of the effects of these extremely low frequency signals in its Wisconsin homeland. You'll um, ELF, or ELF, languished through much of the 1970s. There was some research being done under a similar project called Seafarer, 
and the Wisconsin test facility managed to stay afloat in a ready state. Enter 1981. President Ronald Reagan's hardline approach to Soviet communism revived the ELF program, but at a much smaller scale. The 28-mile antenna array and transmitter existing at Clam Lake would be joined with a larger 57-mile array in Republic, Michigan, 148 miles away. This is near the K.I. Sawyer Air Force Base in the Upper Peninsula. These two stations could run independently or be synchronized to increase their range and penetration. With both stations on the air, a signal would carry over the Arctic Circle through much of the Atlantic and into the Pacific as far west as the Philippines. Project ELF was back in business. Construction began on a facility in Republic, Michigan in 1985, and Clam Lake was upgraded with four 650 kilowatt transmitters, and Republic would have four 500 kilowatt transmitters. The combined power output of these sites, when synchronized, was a 4.4 megawatt signal that radiated deep into the ground. Test transmissions continued through the 1980s, and by 1989, both Clam Lake and Republic were on full-time service, transmitting a signal 24 hours a day. Now let's talk a little bit about the signal, as you really can't send a voice message to the submarines underwater. Instead, a digital mode known as minimum shift keying was used. Minimum shift keying, or MSK, modulates each half of the signal's sine wave. It's relatively impervious to uh, linear distortion, but the bit rate which is determined by the frequency sep separation, can be very slow. Since we're talking about a signal of 76 hertz, an MSK signal would have an extremely low bit rate, and it would take up to 15 minutes to deliver a three-character code. The signal was carried on aluminum cables strung out on 30-foot poles in an antenna system radiating out seven miles in each of four directions, or 28 miles total. To the casual observer, the antenna looked just like nondescript power lines. At the end of each antenna was a terminator at a dry well casing bored deep into the bedrock. The signal would radiate deep into the ground. The Navy, finding that the Earth is resonant at 7.6 hertz, used 76 hertz as the tenth fundamental frequency, in essence, using the very poor conductivity of the bedrock to resonate the Earth. I find it hard to characterize the sound of the ELF transmitters. An author of a popular communications magazine article in 1988 called the transmitters hum subtle but eerily powerful. I think the best explanation I found is that it sounded much like the Taos hum. In Taos, New Mexico, there is a otherworldly sound that modulates around 80 hertz. People in northern Wisconsin said you could hear a similar humming noise when the transmitters were operational, but I have no definitive proof or recordings of that. ELF transmissions continued at the Clam Lake and Republic Michigan sites until 2003. At this time, the technology of submarine signaling had eclipsed the brute force of extremely low frequency transmissions, and the ELF project was always a lightning rod to political opposition from being held up as a waste in uh, government spending by politicians to opposition by environmental and anti-war groups. The transmitter, while seemingly benign, was never such. Through much of the 1990s, protesters would cut down antenna poles or sever transmission lines. The 28 miles of antennas, which were for the most part unguarded as they were in the National Forest, while uh, transmission lines were um, obscured when they were across the roads or other public right-of-ways, they were really pretty much an easy target to protest. So where does this leave us today? Even though the transmitter operated through the 1990s, I believe the end of the Cold War and the disarmament of much of the world's nuclear weapons left Project ELF by the wayside. It is not much of a necessity to run a fail-safe type transmission operation, especially since global nuclear war was, is now seen as a low risk. The forward march of technology, along with the lack of political favor, deemed the project obsolete. In 2004, Project ELF officially ended. The Republic Michigan site was mothballed, but the Clam Lake site was completely decommissioned. The decision to close the facility stated that it was functionally obsolete as there were better methods of signaling submarines. By 2007, the transmission lines had been completely removed and the buildings, with the exception of one, at the transmitter site all raised. But we can still visit the site 
and get a feeling for the scope of Project Elf. So Joe and I did just that. On a sunny October day, we took a trip through the Shawamigan Nicolay National Forest, bouncing along poorly maintained forest roads to look at antenna cuts in the forest and location of the Clam Lake transmitter itself. All of the land has returned to the Forest Service and there is nothing of a military interest left. But walking into the site, you get an inkling of what it must feel like to be on the ground zero points of global thermonuclear war. Phone. Yep. The so this would be the drive to the transmitter site. Yeah. And actually that clearing there is part of the facility. This building here I think is one of the original buildings. I think it's used by the Forest Service now. Yeah, it's a, yeah they're just using for storage. Of course, when this was in operation, this would have been all gated and fenced. And we would have probably had a couple M16s in our face. Yeah. And you can see right down this way where one of the cuts was for the antenna. And it goes down this way. Yep, and there's another, there's another big cut. Really, the facility wasn't that large. It was just half a dozen buildings, mostly steel sheds like this, um, held the transmitter, uh, gener power generators, and that's about it. Yeah, here's your grounding right back here. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you scared me there. No. Yeah, look at that cable. It's like weaved almost. And so it's smaller strands and then they weaved it into a bigger one. Okay. And here's the big boy then this must have been attached. It's plastic, so it's an insulator or something. The uh, transmission cables were aluminum. Yeah, this is aluminum. This Alumi is real light. Yeah, aluminum wire. This is real well, Aluminum light. cable, I should say. I would say this may be the same type of cable that they used for the transmission. And they're using it for their grounding system. Yeah, it's real flexible, actually. That's interesting. Huh. Yeah. We're here on one of the many uh, forest roads that uh, the Project ELF antenna array uh, crisscrossed along its 22-mile uh, length. Uh, the antennas, you know, they came out in sort of a cross or an X configuration uh, from the transmitter site, and each leg was approximately seven-ish miles. And here you can kind, of, you can still see the cuts where the uh, where the antenna uh, ran. The antennas were on telephone poles about uh, 30 feet in height and they just they just went out down down the cut and at the end of each leg were terminated giant well casings uh, driven into the bedrock they were terminated and the way in which the antenna resonated is that um, the ground here geologically is um, very hard. There's a, a bedrock is close is is close to the surface here. It's a very old um, Precambrian uh, basalt, so it's uh, hard 
igneous rock uh, that um, when the transmitter kicked in, you know, there was, there's, there was practically no ground conductivity. So it had the antennas, you know, that the signal had very good ground penetration, but nothing, you know, nothing to really radiate into the air. And that was the whole purpose of Project ELF, is, is to get that signal into the ground, go through the ground, go through the water, and reach the submarines. The cuts here, you know, they're about, a, they're a couple hundred yards wide. And um, they're still, um, uh, you can't, you know, the, the antennas were removed in the early 2000s, so, you, so a lot of the uh, scrubby poplars in that are growing up, so they're getting harder to harder to see. But um, because there's an, uh, an established elk herd here, they're somewhat maintained for, because the elk like to use these, uh, uh, these long antenna runs as part of their habitat. To this day, you can still see the scars of the transmitter site and antennas in the uh, National Forest. I think that this is the legacy of the ELF site, a scar on landscape that's a reminder of how close we were to being on the brink of destruction during the Cold War, but is now a vital habitat for the national forest deer and elk population. I'd like to thank everyone that helped with the production of this video, especially Aaron Webb for pitching me the idea and Travis Augustine for showing us the forest roads in and around the site. Thank you to Joe for coming along on this adventure and giving his perspective. Also, big thank you to our patrons over on Patreon for helping keep the mission alive to educate and inspire the amateur radio community. Your support helps us produce content like this. Are you interested in more about Project Elf? A bibliography with many of my references are down in the video description below. Questions, comments, leave them below. I'll try to answer them. Your support of this channel drives the production of future videos. So like and subscribe, check us out on Patreon. And that's it for this time. I'm Michael, KB9VBR. Have a great day and 73.